part of that. Okay. Is this working? Okay, let's go. Uh, so I'm talking about this book. Uh, I specifically picked this book because uh, uh, the authors are uh, people that um, work with uh, cognitive science, yes, but also with artificial intelligence. So, um, <clears throat> and then uh, right at the outset, I've used as much as I could find free images, but if I missed anything, so there is the disclaimer. Um, so what is the flavor of cognitive science that uh, I want to talk about here uh, right now is uh, thinking of it as a computer. So then what kind of computer? Um, <clears throat> so uh, more precisely, cognitive science tries to form this ideal computer by drawing from uh, convergent perspectives in all these disciplines. So uh, still, the idea of cognitive science is centered on the idea of computation. Uh, how can you build a computing machine that uh, can form a theory that reconciles all of these disciplines? <clears throat> um, here are some theorized abilities of this cognitive machine. Uh, the input is represented somehow. And into that representation goes several things like prior knowledge, consciousness. Uh, we don't. We are still trying to figure out what else. And then there's some uh, transformation module that can transform the representation as required for processing uh, for some downstream task. And that entire pipeline representation transformation then processing you can sum it up as reasoning. So. <clears throat> mm. Uh, so from here on out, I'll talk about uh, ideas in the book that stood out to me that I didn't really pay too much attention to before. Uh, physical constraints of the machine. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, when we are trying to um, build a model of the brain in a computer, uh, uh, at least uh, for me, I was not very much thinking about the kind of computation model for a brain, for example, that might be vastly more superior, probably is in combinatorially uh, hard and challenging issues than a computer is. So the reason uh, probably is that brain can do quantum computing versus we are for now at least restricted to digital computing on very large scale integrated circuits. And to bridge that gap, uh, we develop efficient algorithms. Um, <clears throat> there are metaphysical constraints. For example, we, I, I, how would we encode free will, right, uh, in this reasoning pipeline? <clears throat> okay. So generally, uh, at a very distilled level, the um, inference pipeline is as follows. You get some input. You perceive that input. You pass it through your cognitive machine and you get them, get an output. Um, so here is an example of what might be happening in that cognitive machine. Cognition machine is the, you perceive, because that Im input image, it has legs and hands and eyes, right? But we can look at it and say it's an art. So we are abstracting out the essence of that image, which is the image abstractor. Uh, we are abstracting out other essential features uh, like those um, uh, things in between. And then a reasoner um, triangulates on what may be the possible things that we're looking at based on the abstract understanding of the input. Um, another one. So here uh, we see the importance of context. You have that input uh, on the left, and then you're asking what is the object in the middle? So if you think of uh, the context as being what is the number in the uh, in the center at the center, uh, you would answer thirteen. Yeah. Instead, if you think about the context, what's the alphabet at the center, you will answer B. So uh, you need to provide adequate context to disambiguate uh, information in in your input. <clears throat> and somewhere in that cognition machine, that context abstractor is present. 
Okay. So now neural networks, they do all of these things and um, the formula for a neural network is uh, everything is data in a um, uh, vector space. Uh, so you have prior knowledge that goes into the machine. We saw that that you can encode in a vector space. The consciousness you that needs to go into this machine. We saw that that also you can encode in a vector space. So if you haven't heard about people trying to en encode consciousness before, I would recommend looking up work by uh, Yoshua Benjo, the Turing Award winner. So he has model consciousness as a consciousness prior before. Okay, well, yeah, no, he uh, also there's an algorithm for it. Yeah, uh, it's based on energy-based models. Before he started yeah, I, doing, I, I yeah. did the first part. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I say it is based on energy-based models, uh, uh, there in two lines, what how he models consciousness is that there's an energy function that you can build, where uh, if the machine is very aware of uh, its um, inputs and outputs. That is how he precisely defines consciousness. The value that that energy function will take will be very high. So that's how he models consciousness. <clears throat> huh? G pre precursor to G flow. No? Um, and then uh, everything. So everything you can encode in a vector space and pass it into a neural network and uh, it can hopefully uh, or at least uh, several people believe that it can uh, take the role of this cognition mission. But <clears throat> uh, that is just a joke, you can ignore it. Um, I don't think that uh, is the end of it. The reason for that is, um, uh, so in uh, cognitive science, I heard this recently at the AAA conference, a lot of people were talking about predictive coding. Uh, has anyone heard of predictive coding? Um, so what is predictive coding? Uh, what does a language model do? It is continuously trying to predict the next word. So continuously is a misnomer there. It is in a static setting trying to predict the next word. What it, predictive coding is, is uh, continuously trying to predict something uh, um, based on the inputs that we get from our environment. The, uh, and when I say continuously, I mean, to focus on the speed of it, it's rapid. Uh, so, and the uh, way that we can talk about this more cleanly is maybe a perception cycle. Uh, you get inputs and then uh, you, uh, that inputs can either reinforce your existing schema, it can extend it, or it can uh, break your schema. So you may have to add new schema elements. Uh, and then uh, that procedure, uh, let's call it learning cycle for now. Um, humans do all the time. So we need a, le a learning mechanism that allows for this uh, learning cycle. And uh, calculus is not that mechanism. The reason that calculus is not that mechanism is because uh, uh, very um, beginnings of calculus, uh, the, the fundamental theorems prove that any function that you can do calculus on needs to be continuous and differentiable. But the world is full of discontinuities. You'll see something that doesn't fit into your lost surface all the time, and it will appear like some uh, horrible looking kink on your lost surface. And so adapting quickly using gradient based updates is not possible. It's mathematically not possible. So what do you do? Uh, to smoothen out the lost surface when you see discontinuity, you have to repeatedly see the discontinuity so that you can carefully smooth out that lost surface. And um, uh, what is the outcome of smoothing out that lost surface this way is not that you have handled the discontinuity, it's you, that you have ignored it. But you are trying to find a rough approximation. Yeah, you are, you are trying to find a rough approximation that uh, takes into account this new observation. Um, so uh, some more examples that uh, humans, um, yeah, they see um, uh, newer kind of examples that uh, disrupt their schema of a bird, let's say, uh, continuously. And they need to integrate uh, this new information into their schema rapidly. And like I just discussed, um, 
neural network uh, learning mechanisms. So neural networks as an approximation function is uh, there's no problem. They can approximate everything. The problem is with gradient descent. To do gradient descent, you need the function that is being approximated to be continuous and differentiable in a compact domain. And that's, that never happens in the real world. So then what do we do about it? <clears throat> so people said that we have learning mechanisms based, built on logic, formal logic, that allows for discontinuous um, in, uh, learning outcomes, learning-based integration. But that is not it. So sure, you have um, 10,000 birds that you have seen that can fly, and now you see a chicken. And the learning mechanism in formal logic, what it will do is it will backtrack all of those 10,000 birds that you had seen before. So basically it will say, I have no consistent model of a bird right now. Um, and that's uh, that's not the solution. The so and that kind of reasoning is called inductive reasoning. Uh, inductive reasoning is uh, um, usually done by most uh, familiar logic, like first order logic and things like. <clears throat> Abductive reasoning is uh, less brittle and more um, suited for uh, this learning cycle, which is that I've seen a chicken; it's not capable of flying. I've seen ten thousand other birds that can fly. That's okay. So now all I need to do is add a link in my knowledge base that says chickens can fly. It inherits everything else about a bird, which I can still reason about, but it can't fly. That's it, right? You don't have to account for falsifying inductive logic implications of this new observation, right? <clears throat> um, another problem with um, that I didn't think about before is physics. Uh, so, um, uh, an example that um, uh, Joshua Tenenbaum talked about at AAA, I, he asked, uh, I don't, I think it was GPT-3, um, I mean, chat GPT. Uh, so there's a ball under a table. How do you get the ball out? You're given three things. One is a hockey stick. Another thing is peanut butter. And the third thing is a yarn of thread. Uh, what chat GPT responded with, is that apply peanut butter to the edge of the string, dangle that string under the table until the ball sticks to the string, use the hockey stick for assistance if you can't get it out this way, right? So um, is this wrong? Probably not. But uh, uh, a toddler would uh, try and put their hand under the table. So they know that you need to knock something out of there using something like a hockey stick. They don't even know how to speak yet, but they already know this. Right, so uh, uh, something that may be lacking in uh, the way neural networks are trained, again, neural networks themselves, this is an established fact that they can learn uh, anything that's representable in our current, um, uh, given our current understanding of mathematics. They can, they can represent it, but how do you learn such a neural network? We don't have good procedures for it right now. <clears throat> Um, so this is work from uh, Vedan's previous work. So before I get there, um, what is neurosymbolic AI? How can we deal with that? So you take um, some input from um, a physical system. So you have these balls and cylinders and square things moving around. And then you have questions you want to know about uh, certain things. So what color is the last object to collide with the blue cube and so on. Um, if you want to know this, you can try a neural network to give you the answer directly. Or what you can do is convert that question in uh, using the images cues into a set of instructions. So uh, first get blue colored objects and then get blue colored objects that are cube shaped, then get unique object there because there is the blue cube, not every blue cube, get unique objects, then get collision partners of blue cube shaped unique objects, because you need to figure out what is the last object that collided, order those collision partners, and then get the last uh, item on that list and figure out its color. So you have a, a sequence of instructions that you can execute to answer this question. A similar thing for question two. 
So neurosymbolic AI would be where you take your perception network so, um, and then convert it into a set of well-defined instructions. And you have a uh, execution machine that can execute those instructions and give you the answer, right? So um, um, if you do something like this, then you can let your neural network uh, train using gradient descent procedures, which is the way it is do, uh, done right now. So your neural network can get superbly good at perception if it hasn't already, right? At low level perception. Um, then you can, on top of it, include a layer that uh, allows abductive learning processes, which is not gradient descent, it's something else, uh, which can uh, reason at a macro level rapidly. An example of this is Interlego in Corey Hansen's work um, and produce outputs. So then ideally, what would be the properties of this neurosymbolic AI system? It would be probabilistic. For example, uh, there are things in this frame that you don't see, right? Uh, what is the last object to collide with a blue cube if I ask about? Uh, if I had asked instead, what is the first object? I don't know where this blue cube entered from. It could have collided with a million other things, right? So uh, the neurosymbolic AI system needs to uh, elegantly model possibilities that are outside of the things being perceived. Uh, Non-monotonic. Non-monotonic is conducive to fast objective learning. We just talked about it. Monotonic would mean that you see some new observation that destroys your schema of the world and you, you're very concerned. You don't know what to do about it. So that is monotonic reason. Um, and uh, we'd like the neural network part of this neurosymbolic AI. So I'm calling that perception neural networks to produce simple representations. For example, these instructions uh, are to the neural network just a sequence to sequence problem because this is a sequence right now. Um, it, instead, now this is not, uh, I'm not <laughs> trying to um, say this work is not uh, ideal. But I'm just saying generating something like this using a neural network is much harder because this uses full first order logic than generating a sequence, which is not using full first order logic. It's using a restricted functional program, uh, much easier to um, generate by a neural network. Uh, so probability reasoning, remember, we learned lots of relative cycle. Mm -hmm. So for the missing information, there's a relative cycle to seek for additional information. That was fundamental aspects of our semantic perception cycle. Mm -hmm. right? That's what we have to do. Uh, and there is a understand the role of interlocal as an ontology for something that coordinates that. Mm -hmm. You know, it controls that. It's not arbitrary, uh, you know, uh, uh, as you go from objective and then next second zone, I will repeat. That's the conductor. Mm -hmm. and that, that, understand that role of ontology there. Here, understand we used, uh, you know, uh, in Pramod's work, probabilistic graph, right? Because I was convinced of, I, I, I saw the limitations of modeling uh, of the other, uh, you know, uh, representations and all the rich representation part thing. Uh, you know, basically goes to implicit formal part, mm -hmm. right? Powerful. Uh, we're looking for something and then we end up with this one. But in that case, again, understand the role of the three ontologies we use mm -hmm. and how those ontologies play the role. So it is not just using probabilistic learning, but it is, you know, using uh, the ontologies in that context. Mm -hmm. It is not just a uh, uh, you know, and relative uh, thing. It is using interval to coordinate the process. Mm -hmm. And that is to provide the context, that is to focus on the uh, you know, issues at hand to solve that problem rather than learn everything that data can tell. Right. right. So I think that those things are important to understand. Uh, and perhaps you can uh, uh, combine them mm -hmm. to move out from the you see the data. Right. So the fourth property that this system needs to have, it needs to be tightly coupled. So for example, imagine that this program executor that takes the instructions and produces the output is parameterized. When you tweak the parameters of that program, does it also tweak the parameters of the neural network? I think it should, 
because uh, uh, say when humans reason, uh, they you make. Use the word word or something or feedback or you know, some appropriate word. I don't know the word. I'm not sure about type part. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah. So we have heard a lot nowadays about federated systems. For example, you take the neural network from ChatGPT, and then you find out if it's a math question, and you query Wolfram Alpha, right? But then if Wolfram Alpha, you want to make changes, it will not make any change to ChatGPT. So what I meant to say by tightly coupled is if you have a, a ideal neurosymbolic reasoning system, that change that neuro, uh, Wolfram Alpha um, had to go through will be reflected in how ChatGPT processes future inputs, right? <clears throat> um, so uh, I think slides are okay. Yeah. So um, this is uh, from Ruan's work. Uh, again, it's similar to where I talked about uh, when I asked about what is the first object. Um, you don't know which other objects that it collided with. So in in Ruan's work, for example, a way that they encode context, like Dr. Shet was saying, right? You you need context to. Um, hone in on what you want to pay attention to. Uh, he uses a, a, a knowledge graph to say that, okay, I'm seeing a ball. So relevant things to this ball and a car could be a child following the ball, not everything, right? Still, there is the moon revolving the earth, but we are not paying attention to that, right? So the knowledge graph can um, help contextualize better. <clears throat> so uh, I actually, oh yeah, that's it. Um, so what I wanted to talk about also was existing work along this line mm, here. So this is uh, work that Dr. Chet said recently. Uh, what happens here is that the neural part is whatever it is. And then the symbolic part is fuzzy logic rules. This is an example of a tightly coupled system. Mm -hmm. When you change the fuzzy logic rule uh, parameters, uh, the neural network parameters also change. Uh, the problematic part with this is that the whole thing is end-to-end -end differentiable. And so that brings me back to the point I made earlier in the slide. Because. Exactly. Yeah. Anything that requires differentiable learning everywhere will naturally be brittle. So uh, that's why we want to simplify probabilistic. Right. Yes. Yeah. So that, that, that is a segment to this other one where, um, oh, this one. Um, not this one. So I wanted to do the dream coder, if anyone has heard of it. Okay. Okay. It was. So this is just to show uh, an example. There, uh, an example of how uh, you reason about uh, probability. So you have all these things that could happen, and then you solve a um, program uh, that results in all the different things that uh, you need to um, maintain a probability distribution over. And this kind of um, uh, the learning process. So you have a prior probability distribution. You see new observations. You obtain a new probability distribution based on the new observation is not gradient descent. So it is more suited to rapid learning. So that, that I think that's all. Yeah. When you say tightly coupled system, uh, fuzzy logic changes the neural network itself. Is that can be seen an answer to the black box model? Like the actual and imagined, and the weights are actually fuzzy logic when we when when we see it like this. Uh, what is the answer like that? The answering the black box model. You're and saying explaining the black yeah. box model. So, so um, I think that it is futile to explain the black box model 
completely in very high fidelity form. For example, when economists are talking about uh, um, principles that can affect or not affect recession or the possibility, of, they never get it right. Humans uh, are reasoning at a macro level. Uh, neural networks are reasoning with uh, very low level information. So explaining that using macro level concepts uh, and doing better than, yeah, I have some theories for why certain macro events happen is very hard, I think. You cannot explain for you're driving a car uh, and then the car, you have to turn the steering wheel, right? Should you explain the fact that you need to turn the steering wheel at a particular angle at a, when you're at a particular position. Those, that is very low level information. You only need to explain, I see a stop sign, I stop. So I'm not sure explaining the black box in its entirety is too fruitful an exercise. I have questions. Compared to the black box, so I, let me start with something. So when Ian Nikon visited I so uh, after his lot of talks, so, so this actually came up in data versus. So he mentioned something. I mean, I'm not saying he take the other thing without criticism. See, mm -hmm. he, he criticized chat GPT. Now he publishes when mm -hmm. Okay, see, he also has bias. So for example, he said one very nice thing is, uh, see, think about a 10 year kid. How much information he or she processed so far? If he or she is away, 18 hours, how much audio visual received so far? So when AI system would be able to reach and this foundation will be able to you know train on that amount of data, then then you will compare with this. So that is his, you know, one it's a, it's a very interesting point. And if so you see I, I, I disagree with that because okay, uh, yes, the architecture I'm of the human brain is different from uh, what he starts. Okay. So but it has been seen now in the last two years or so. The amount of you know this foundation model is increasing. It started showing a lot of new new you know features, which is not able to see in the slower model. Mm -hmm. And it is not only you know textual. Yeah, but there was entire there was entire on that that the, the, the guy from Microsoft talking yes. about image and proteins and that TV. No, I mean you, uh, you can say that. Yeah, I mean, but but the output is showing something promising. Yeah, so but that is it, you know intelligence where there is no no intelligence. I'm coming. Let, let me put it. So, uh, so one example of the Microsoft talk was when you see a very large vision language model, smaller model can't you know produce the text in the image. But when you increase the size, we're not doing anything extra. It's able to do. So another quote I will put here. I mean the belief. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just you know putting the counter because see, here you are presenting. Let's say Professor said also believes your idea. He's supporting it. But when you're presenting to the outside, it will kill you by giving the outside thing. And you should know, because you, you said a lot of things which is not true. I'll come there. So <clears throat> the second part, OK. So there's, again, a quote from the CTO of Hugging Grace. He says, see, we are in an AI world when things will be solved, but we can't explain why it is happening. Mm. So probably we are somehow heading towards that. Now, the second part of the story, what you started saying this, you know, uh, kind of little bit of mathematical confusing in jargons that uh, real world things are not differentiable, etc. Which sounds good, but it's not true. Why? You probably don't know there are good, very good progress on non convex optimization. If you look at the last four years of ICM and ICL, typically look at Manik Burman's paper from Microsoft Research. He's a very well known guy for non convex optimization. And there's significant progress. Okay. Okay. So what he was saying is not possible. It's actually possible. There I don't see the connection. Yeah. So, so when you're saying the real world thing is not differentiable, end to end. No, I don't see the connection between differentiable and non convex I'm not coming to that. So, when you are saying it's not, so show me a real life problem. So, let's say I'm, I'm an NLP guy. <clears throat> That's a summarization, machine translation, etc. So, don't tell me one exception. So let's, say, let's, say, let's say Google now. Okay. Any, everybody can tell you one or two stories for Google Maps fail, but you can't deny the larger usability of Google Maps. Mm -hmm. So when you are saying the continuation has to be drawn in the gradient descent kind of format, it's not. So if you look at those words, which actually talk about non-convex optimization, they talked about it. They talked about what? 
so this when you are seeing the discontinuity is there okay yeah, so they talked about this uh, optimization methods and so sure forth. i only said gradient descent is not good for that yes so so non convex uh, you know uh, optimization using gradient descent is possible so people made significant progress towards that line so, so doctor that's uh, well, all i'm saying is gradient descent is not good when you don't even you have discontinuity okay really? so what i'm saying look at manik burma and this kind of work which might give you a different perspective Right? Okay. Okay. This is also possible. This way also possible. People are also thinking this this line of thought. So so these are just few input points. From so for example, the um, uh, optimization for uh, this top part mm. that you add on top of a neural network mm. uh, is still uh, in a family of non-convex optimization. It's just not gradient based. Mm. So I never said not. Ah, so the, yeah. that's my point. Is yeah. It is possible to apply added mechanism in the gradient based mechan you know system. To input that as well, and there are work, there are significant progress towards that line. So, mm, okay, uh, for, so the probabilistic reasoning that I talked about, how do you do that? Hmm. That is also a type of analytical compute, just like gradient is. It's just not gradient descent based. Hmm. That's all I'm saying. Maybe people are working about convex optimization. They are, I'm sure. But uh, I'm uh, drawing attention to the fact that if you stick to gradient descent based learning of everything, we're not going to get far. That, that is, I mean, I don't agree on that point. Okay. Yeah, but that is where uh, I would say a firm philosophical belief, which I put in the data and knowledge reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may or may not have been best expressed, but uh, I just don't see. Um, um, a system that is purely learning from data to any time be the system that also uses knowledge. The amount of knowledge that is collected in UMLS, the amount of knowledge that is collected in a variety of uh, sources mm -hmm. is simply not something that we uh, learn that level of specificity, concreteness, uh, you know, quality. Uh, it, it, there may be a bits and pieces that may be uh, you know learned indirectly through the data but it would simply not be you know organized with the same uh, relationships and taxonomy that humans consider to be relevant to understand to apply to a domain the whole medical domain let's say just for sake of discussion or pharma domain is built upon a particular model and schema uh, whereby you know there is a drug discovery or drug you know a molecule or there is a toxicology studies these are concepts that are very important for the enterprises for the whole decision making process without incorporating them without incorporating that kind of specific knowledge that are relevant your purely learning from data is simply not going to get into the form that will be useful for decision making that is a firm belief you can you know, go, uh, you know, go, uh, show me all the kind of emergent intelligence and just won't convince me at all that this is going to be as close to as thing. You won't convince me ever that uh, human experience that has been gained, you know, is gives you competitive advantage. Uh, uh, you know, the incipient uh, behavior, uh, you know, emergent, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, things that uh, people talk about. To me, is very incidental to very uh, you know human putting the interpretation, saying look, it you know suddenly this thing changed uh, you know at this time after this thing they, it learned. That is, they learned only in the context of classifying that object, and uh, in so so that 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 will remain. Uh, you know, I think Inter and you know Lacour and all can you know go as much as they can, but they will. I, I feel that uh, philosophically, I'm not going to buy that at all. And the, uh, the amount of ready-made power available in this uh, collectively human developed knowledge is just so much that uh, saying that, oh, I somehow learned from all the data, is just not going to work. Uh, you know, the simple example that the ghee is bad and ghee is good, you know, uh, or, or egg, you know, yolk is bad and egg yolk is good. And these changes, this is something that will be extremely hard uh, for um, uh, any of these models to pick up. So no, this example is a syntactic problem. No, 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 it's not syntactic. The point is the point is that uh, you know certain belief was considered to be uh, one, and then they change, 
or that uh, this particular actor was married three different times to three different people. And of course, there was a part that he was not married to. Without having that temporal aspects and knowledge, uh, it's simply going to be not possible for the system to delineate. You have the entire, you know, uh, world's corpus and uh, unlimited, you know, data. Mm -hmm. But for it to understand that this um, uh, a knowledge base, Wikipedia already tells you that this guy was uh, married this first person, uh, you know, first wife, and then divorced, then second wife divorced, third wife divorced. Uh, that uh, data that is available to us is simply not going to be learned from the uh, 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 the, the corpus that you see the your network, uh, uh, and certainly not anywhere, uh, you know, with the clarity that on this day he married and on this day he was divorced. All that, you know, thing which just won't be there, but uh, it's all given to you. It's all available in Wikipedia. And uh, combining the two is superior to just saying, oh, I'll somehow learn it from the data. Then you have to continue on this one. Yeah. Anyway, so. Give me a counter to this. Oh, okay. So, okay, see, uh, so what I would say that we are knowingly picking up an exceptional problem. This is not an exception. No, no, All the time, you know, this, listen, listen. these are the facts. Listen. So, see, let's say I build a, you know, a data set. Let's say I want to solve summarization. Let's say I want to solve machine translation problem. Let's say I want to solve question answering problem to certain domain. Now, what happened in the last few years is our performance using all these language models and etc. gone really high. Now, I'm picking up one cherry pick example that see, this is not working. But let's say I'm not interested in that exception. I'm interested in the overall, you know, service to the you know, problem. So uh, in the five years back, summarization accuracy was, if you, if you look at the Bruce Paul, Bruce Conner, et cetera, was 0.5 and etc. Today, if you look at Seren, Delhi, Mail, and kind of problem, people are at 90. Okay. And so why what is saying, happening? Yeah. Why, why? What my point is, so I can always find out, let's say, this is starting from top, uh, which is very, you know, very you know, humorous and etc. to, you know, how you know. But you know, we are expecting too much from a machine. I mean, you pick a very exceptional problem and give it to chat GPT and say it's not working. But look at the positive side, side of it. It is solving so much problem. So for my example, see, you, you can always find out when Google Maps fails. I also have, you know, four or five examples I can give you. But you cannot deny that Google Maps is serving with so much precision to a lot of people about the world. So we are somehow missing that part. We are only you know, talking about the negativity. No, that's, that, that's, that's my, you know, that's my thing. No, 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 that's not, we are not missing that part. Hmm. Uh, there are problems that these things have done amazing job. Hmm. I don't think that you should take it. That we don't it. speak the, that often. No, yeah. no, 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 no. You, I think you're misunderstanding it. Hmm. First of all, you know, there are problems. What is happening? Huh? Oh, so we are, um, uh, you know, taking, um, uh, there are problems, especially classification. If you look at my explicit uh, knowledge, uh, you know, uh, keyword, uh, my argument was that there are tasks like, uh, classification, recommendation, um, and then in more are being added to that, where these uh, statistical systems are doing, ex, you know, very, very well. And then there are other tasks which are, you know, more decision-making tasks, more, um, uh, you know, uh, action, you know, tasks that you have to take action, abstraction and analogies where these systems don't do well, right? So that is first of all, and, uh, what I want the, my students to focus on are the problems that uh, the current systems don't do very well. So I don't want them to uh, essentially be in a very large pool of people working on and, and be also in a disadvantaged environment. That you look at uh, only a few very elite institutions, the you know people with exceptional amount of data and computation power and some you know, institutions like you know, at Stanford and few other places, they are able, where they have, uh, you know, association where they get access to, uh, you know, um, higher amount of knowledge. And then you are, where you are, uh, 
you don't want to uh, you know be fighting with them directly on the things that they do and you want to look at futuristic problems problems that cannot be done well with the current system and solve them with a method that is also non traditional so that's why we want to do neuro symbolic as opposed to say i um, uh, i can somehow figure out a way to do slightly better than somebody else on the problems that they already solved so by solving why we do you pay attention to all why don't the arguments talk about why symbolic is... neuro huh? why neuro symbolic why not symbolic neuro why, uh, i mean we can also reverse it right what what is it i mean so? symbolic i mean symbolic is the base and then we we add, add neuro i don't it is also possible right no no uh, the, i think this is just a term that captures any different ways of connecting symbolic and neuro Okay. Whether whether you build on uh, mm. symbolic and add neuro or neuro symbolic, I don't care. Mm. I I really what I believe is that the class of problems uh, where these systems don't do very well, mm. and uh, this uh, you know and and um, you recognize that they do very well on these things. So I don't want to go too much into that. I don't waste my time into that because it's just one of them. And there will be paper coming up after coming out and you did a, you know something better than sota and then suddenly the next paper will be yeah, this thing i don't want to be in that game i don't think the students should be in game if you're smart hmm. you need to be different uh, and if you are just doing same thing others we temporarily do something but then it shall be surpassed hmm. so i don't want to be in a you know big you know you know lake with a lot of people i want to be you know have something that I know is of value for sure, and solve them. So you look at uh, you know arguments that uh, we always made, and I made that yes, in healthcare, the healthcare professional cannot, the clinician cannot, uh, will not take any solution that does not have explanation. So do whatever it is, your 900% accuracy. There is uh, in radiology clearly shown studies that. Uh, on average, uh, the uh, uh, you know vision system does better uh, than a uh, human does. It's already done, but they are not accepted. And then there are a lot of papers that find that those that there is a uh, uh, when this system claim to be uh, accurate, they are actually not. So there are you know uh, paper, papers that have come out saying that these evaluations have been wrong. The data's choices have been wrong. All that kind of stuff. So much of the uh, you know uh, improvement that is shown, at least in the evaluations, is because the evaluations are uh, of the things that are not so important. That the glue standard, super glue standard, are really not reflective of some of the tasks that I want to do. That are that the world needs. So there are papers recently we talked about right uh, doing new evaluations. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys, you are thinking about something. Yeah. So we really have to um, define new evaluations and, uh, uh, and what task is solved and say, now they won't be doing 90%. And we will do better than uh, the state of the art would be. That is where you want to be. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the example that you gave me. A person is married three times. And um, the the information that was given married prior to number one on this date, the world turned on this date, it's just that the date was not married. So um, I'm, I want to understand what is the task that you uh, want to solve using this piece of information and how is it any different than just retrieving some extra amount of information which at the end of the day is data once again. What do you mean? You know, I mean, arguing that knowledge is stored as a data is a nonsense. I'm, I'm not. I'm not questioning that. Hmm. My question is, uh, how can you recreate this particular? Uh, are you? Are you have question that whether this kind of knowledge is valuable or not? No, that is not okay. my question. My I question mean, you want to figure out the uh, elements of children, or you want to figure out. Uh, you know. Uh, you know how uh, this this law applied uh, for the. Uh, you know, uh, use of uh, property that this guy had. You know, you have to, you have to have that knowledge. There are many uh, examples. You know, this knowledge is valuable for many things that you do with regards to this guy. Right? I mean, uh, it, it, 
the knowledge is very very relevant to you know the that person's life okay uh, so, so that, that is also my question, question. I, I mean this is i mean maybe a hypothetical situation the exactly same question i always have give me a situation where i need this i uh, i want to solve summarization problem or i want to solve machine translation problem i want to solve some sentiment analysis problem why do i need this you don't so because you are talking about language translation you don't need this right so, well, so, so i mean there are uh, there are tasks hmm. where uh, uh, the, you look at my keynote hmm. i don't even uh, the keynote that i gave for at asunam or uh, you know at that uh, yeah, uh, that workshop asunam one i i have nlp to uh, nlu huh. right pay attention to that i clearly uh, explain with that that there are all these nlp tasks that are done very very well but you need to when you need understanding when you are doing language translation you don't have to understand uh, the language my follow up huh? my follow up is the same question okay let's say, let's say, okay this is an argument that this is a piece of wonderful knowledge now this is a graph right and then i have to extract from graph right i mean i need an algorithm to extract from graph right this algorithm now this extraction part if i'm using an algorithm i'm also using probabilistic algorithm some kind of right because this is a graph in a graph i need to traverse and how i design or you know define the traversal thing is also probabilistic no i mean uh, uh, the it's not determinist the semaphore's uh, algorithm is not probabilistic they are built upon dijkstra's work you know shortest path a variety of i you know uh, dijkstra algorithms huh. on on graph dijkstra is done you know original work on thing they are very very still uh, continue to be extremely relevant mm. and you she has modified those algorithm and adapted it to the rdf graph no graph is fine but what is the traversal algorithm i i have to traverse the graph right oh. let's say i have a very uh, let's say I, I build a very big knowledge graph mm. uh, let's say let's say csk which is uh, joy is using 2 million nodes and obviously uh, i don't know how many edges obviously lot of edges now i have to design an algorithm which can traverse this graph right now any algorithm out there today graph traversal etc all are probabilistic in some way or other probabilistic uh, they are uh, uh, they are uh, you know there is no probability involved in you know following up, following the no no see, see let's let's have a question answer system let's say i am there is a selectivity and quantitative things involved as to how many Branches there are those things. I'm I'm coming to a very exact example. Let's say, let's say, uh, let's say Elon Musk. Your example perfectly fit Elon Musk. Okay, he married so many times and you know first wife, second wife, etc. Now let's say I have a question answer system. I'm trying to question answer, getting some question and get the answer from machine about Elon Musk. Okay, let's say this is my situation. Now let's say I got a situation. Okay, I I ask a question to the system. Now system has to understand the question and extract the you know answer from. Now. when i give this question is a piece of natural language now the system has to pick up some item from here and has to design something some mechanism representation mechanism and it has to land to the mind knowledge graph right yeah and and extract information yeah now this part this you know figuring out what to extract from yeah. my input yeah. and then jump into knowledge graph yeah. do some traversal yeah. and extract out what is needed yeah. and again putting back so this whole there is not first of all because you are always thinking from data perspective you have forgotten all 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 uh, huge body of work that has happened in structured uh, you know data processing uh mm -hmm. so no yeah you do have to uh, you know uh, parse and create uh, mm -hmm. the thing but once you have created that and that is there is a lot of work on that once you have created that now you are dealing with uh, you know a query language processing that is mass you want to work on database processing and graph database processing and all that stuff there are graph databases and there are you know frans database for example as a massive you know ability to process massive graphs and uh, uh, there are rdf graph processing yeah even neo 4j kind of today situ yes. situation yes. also support that is neo 4j follows the uh, one form of graph uh, these are called property graphs mm. and there are others that follow the rdf graph there are two Uh, competing uh, things there are hmm. pluses and minuses yeah. so, whatever it is hmm. those are being done with large graphs and you know the, i don't think that that is a issue of even question people are have the, are doing graph processing with large graphs 
yeah but the point is that ultimately the information you need is there uh, in in uh, you know the uh, in wikipedia or some such thing no no that's fine and you just can't uh, create a high fidelity information from that from uh, of that kind of thing from one structured data so the corpus that you fit to your neural network simply though you cannot uh, you know uh, apply a neural network and spit out this knowledge graph mm -hmm. uh, that is for that is why we are doing the work that joey is doing right now mm -hmm. but that's not a solved problem mm -hmm. but these knowledge graphs are there mm -hmm. the um, the structure that is conceived of of umls mm -hmm. how are you going to have how are you going to create a um, statistical or neural network algorithm to actually give me that structure that structure is that that structure is immensely useful that is how the uh, uh, you know uh, healthcare researchers have been and 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 clinical researchers and clinical coding has been going on for years that's not going to change so you need to respect the structure and use that structure it's already there and you you, you want to uh, me to use a mechanism which cannot efficiently create a correctly or efficiently create that structure no no i'm again my question is not about structure, so structure is there and one. that means that structure knowledge has to be used in solving the problem that uh, you know if you want if you think that the big data gives you power fine take that power and add this uh, you know thing that is being done uh, you know whatever uh, 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 you know drug design work that is being done or trying to find the uh, reasons uh, why a particular biopathway uh, a particular you know uh, gene is implicated in a particular uh, you know uh, 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 disease all those things that people are doing uh, they are going to be uh, done along the lines of the knowledge represented. You are not going to be able to create that kind of knowledge from your uh, neural network based algorithm and any amount of data. So you got to use, you know, that knowledge. There is no debate whatsoever about the usefulness or the value of a uh, structured data like a knowledge graph. The question it boils down to is, if we are attempting to use a large language model, a neural network based large language model to solve some NLP task, for example, question answering, and we want to use this structured knowledge in order to enhance the performance. This is the problem description. Now, given a question, we are not able to, we don't have enough information in the data to get to the answer. So we look for it in the graph, in the knowledge graph. We found what we need. When we come back into the large language model to generate the output, at the end of the day, if we are using a large language model to do this process, all of this information that we extracted from this beautifully structured knowledge graph, it has to come down to embeddings. Oh, oh, it, that's bad. That's the wrong thing. Why, why do you have to use a large language model? What yes. do you, yes. what so do you solve the problem better? If you don't want to uh, di uh, disintegrate that structure into embeddings, then you have to think beyond a large language model. And that is something that. Yeah, I that's uh, just this morning. That's where I stopped by uh, and had a chat with Joey, encouraging him to give up on the uh, low representative uh, you know, form of thing and consider him used to, uh, to use the uh, uh, you know, uh, representation that are higher uh, representation. I encourage him to uh, start using the the whole decision, uh, whole discussion came down to the following observation. I said, does your, um, you know, uh, representation uh, 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 capture the label of, uh, on the edges? He said, no. I said, focus on that. Uh, get, uh, get to a represent level that uh, uh, captures that i also give him uh, to, you know encourage him to once again look at uh, promotes work saying how do you use knowledge graph model and the knowledge graph both together to solve the problem that if you pay attention to that work you will see that there is no way you could have solved the problem by either or or there had to be a massive processing done on a, a year worth of uh, network data of the road network data uh, to create the anom anomaly and there had to be the use of knowledge graph or ontology 
to understand what that unknown anomaly is about. Two separate problems. That so there is an anomaly uh, that currently on this road, uh, the traffic is slower than normal. For that hour of the day of the, you know, that hour, that day, you know, since uh, uh, Friday uh, for, for that particular part here. And then say, then what are the potential uh, reasons why it can be slow? Was it a road closure? Was it a road series surfacing? Was it a, an event nearby? Was it a weather? And to get all that understanding, he had to use uh, 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 the knowledge graph or ontologies. So that's, uh, you know, an example why both of them are needed to solve the problem. Yes, so uh, what I just mentioned, it brings me back to the point that if, like you agreed with me, right? We, we don't want to bring the uh, knowledge graph, whatever in, information we extract from the knowledge graph, we don't want to bring it to the language. No, no, I'm not saying that. Uh, even in our own early work, we did take knowledge graph and uh, create embeddings. And, uh, you know, the metrics that, uh, um, uh, uh, that that uh, the manas created for CIKM18 is a very lossy thing, but it still showed improvement over uh, uh, the, the SOTA algorithm uh, that was statistical at that time of uh, point of time. Of course, it will show improvement there. Yeah. So 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 my uh, uh, empirical uh, you know uh, observation is that use of knowledge graph and bringing it down and dumbing it down to the data level will show some improvement. There are uh, many, many papers uh, you know, already uh, in literature about uh, knowledge graph embedding. So many of papers are there. And uh, you know, it does show some improvement. And uh, it, it, uh, you know, at least the studies that I've seen that my students have done have uh, basically ended at about 10% improvement. So the proper, in the propelling the, um, what is it, propel the machine understanding of content paper, uh, 2017, um, uh, we had four examples by then in that paper, and each of them we we showed about 10 percent improvement. Those uh, uh, problems were that we are solving were still the problem that are of lower level of intelligence that I have talked about: classification, recommendation, prediction. Um, now it is going up slightly, and the you know so clearly with this you know power of large language model, they are going up. Yet they have not crossed certain threshold in my mind. So they are going up and they are, they are doing question answering. They are very good at uh, question answering with the caveats that I would give. Uh, certain things, uh, knowledge missing because of the missing knowledge, they are, there will be problems. Uh, problem, simple problems like recency problem versus a uh, problem. So you ask uh, chat GPT about something that occurred last week and it's not going to be able to do that, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, but they are going up and they are you know, becoming very satisfactory for some applications. Uh, but we have noticed several problems. Hallucination. 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 Uh, so we, are, we, we have started working on that. And abstraction and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and analogy. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the things that we have uh, uh, identified. Um, and the point here is that, uh, again, so my encouragement to you guys is to work on those problems because they are less solved. We have, we have identified four kinds of hallucination. Mm -hmm. One is implicit, explicit, and negative and positive. Mm -hmm. So we have we are now studying which language model has which kind of hallucination problem. So we are kind of concretizing the problem definition story. Yeah, well, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, the point is though that um, uh, The philosophy is always, uh, you know, uh, work on problem that not everybody in the world is working on. Mm. Work on problem where you bring unique advantage. So uh, work on problem, you know, if I can, uh, I can clearly understand the problem of healthcare better. Work on that, that others don't really. I mean, uh, I, I I picked on a very simple thing that I learned. Clinical, uh, you know, decision making you must use clinical practice guidelines. Now, how the hell those guys are going to have follow clinical practice guidelines without actually learning clinical process guidelines using it? Very simple. It's just, you know, it's, it's just not there in the system. It's not going to be able to learn it anyway. 
and there is no effect you know there's no process to uh, uh, create these step by step things in the uh, you know in, in the in the language model you are not creating the step by step by step aspect kind of uh, task is your task that is to be done has to have different step in a particular order in parallel and sequential thing like in workflow they are not meant for that yet maybe they will figure out a way to do that at some point but right now they are not and this problem uh, this, uh, this process is given to us uh, and that process can be specified in the knowledge graph in the 2006 paper we had for active semantic document the paper where uh, you know my team developed um, uh, the first uh, Electronic medical record utilizing ontology, uh, you know, and applying rules, and rules were specified in the ontology. We were able to, you know, incorporate that kind of knowledge. That is a pro problem uh, where you have unique advantage. So solve them and be the leader. And that's why my former students had thousand citations. It's not easy. I get, uh, I, I, you know, we had thirty paper, you know, submissions. Uh, to a uh, you know faculty position, and uh, nobody has that many citation uh, at at uh, you know assistant professor level. So um, you know, uh, I think that that is so. You select the problem where you can do something. Yeah. Uh, so doctor, said, I'm not sure if you are aware of the book called Noise, which Daniel Kahneman has been yeah. reading. Yeah. I'm reading this book, and uh, he especially talks about uh, the DSM five uh, that we. Currently used for the mental health. Yeah. He says it's the most noisiest uh, data source that is out there. Yeah. And as we keep on going, yes, six, seven, eight, it, it the content that is present in that has the most number of uh, what do we say, like people not agreeing with each other, the mental health researchers. Yes. Yes. So if we are using that kind of no, uh, that, that you, we are aware of that, but that's the best out there, or that's the, that's still the uh, 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 the the. Uh, we work with uh, you know professionals in healthcare and mental health at Wright State University, and that is the part of the curriculum on which they are trained. There is still a lot of disagreement. It's a mental health has a lot of disagreement uh, and and um, um, lack, a lot of lack of clarity. But that's still the best that is out there. Secondly, uh, at least the vocabulary part of that is very easy. Uh, you see, before DSM-5, there was not even an agreement of what you call um, uh, anxiety and depression. So there is clearly a value that a 10 years of committee work has gone to define DSM-5. That is what we need. The discipline is what it is. There are many disciplines where there is agreement of between, uh, only 60% agreement between experts, right? So what, what, is, what is there? I mean, if I have classification algorithm, but the experts that, that themselves agree on 10%. When I had Kali uh, company, we worked with book, uh, 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 you know, uh, in education with people who were book publishers. And uh, we are talking about some um, of school uh, evaluation kind of thing. And I remember some problem there, a classical problem, but the expert themselves have only 60 to 60% agreement. So what does it mean to say I have 80% accuracy in my classification? <laughs> right? So there are things of that nature, uh, and uh, and and then uh, you know the fact is that yes, it is a very noisy domain, and yet you want to make progress, you use that. But at the end of the day, we are doing evaluation with clinicians and with patients. Right? Yeah. So, maybe so even our knowledge is going to be But to show, uh, show the effectiveness, whatever level of knowledge, we are doing any user experiment. That's the best you can do. There is no standard. So, you have to use user experiments, right? There's no more sense, really. And that's what we do. So, from a scientific perspective, this is the best you can do, and you do that. And just to add on, uh, LLMs currently. Especially Google Robotics, they have launched the series of the one is in one of the latest one that they have released. And this is process graded and can actually generate the sequence of uh, action. So I think it's almost there. A lot of them are actually there, uh, which actually give out the process as uh, ordered steps. So 
that is also possible. Yeah, I have uh, just come across it, but I have not read them. Have you? We should. Uh, the one by Google is uh, called as similar monologue, uh, but there are a bunch of others as well where one group of people are using automated planning itself to order the sequence of possible actions that they are given. So, uh, their language model comes in with? Their language model. What are, are you, uh, so you are trying to say that uh, a language model is behind this, or what is the? Yeah, yeah. In both of these works, there is language model. In another one, like it's completely a language model with different uh, pre-training approach that they follow in order to give a sequence of action. The other work uses language model as but uses a uh, automate uh, sorry a planning guided tool instead of the greedy search that LLM actually follows to generate the output in a sequence order. So, okay. So, no, but you know, I think we should look at it for sure. But what is happening here is that they, they are, they are, they are. Um, uh, I guess uh, uh, they are doing snake oil work. Uh, here's it. They're basically, uh, they are not getting the process information for free. They are having human, uh, you know, provide that information. But in all itself, also it's a human at the end of the day, monitoring or constructing right now. No. Yes and no. Uh, the point here is that um, humanness is being done by humans. It's being done anyway. It's there, right? The uh, process, clinical process guideline is done. It's part of the, it has to be done by the cardiologists for their thing, by neurologists for their thing. It's there. And that's what we are using. So what is the purpose of trying to get some 40, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people to say we are going to come up with something? No, it's, it's that it, their thing would not ultimately win because what we are using is the best practice for that particular domain. Right? Yeah. The point is that they, 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 have, they have incorporated enough of the process information provided by humans in the language model, but it didn't come for free. It did involve human providing that information. So, how is that, you know? Uh, anything better, we are using existing process in information knowledge into guiding uh, the you know steps that you need to take. Right? So it, it's wrapping and calling it, uh, you know, uh, it, this goes back to the uh, thing, uh, you know, when I went to Yahoo and showed here is what Google does and here is my what Tali did. Um, Clearly, Google did not do anything, uh, you know, like what Tali did because we had that knowledge graph and we had that info box equivalent of thing which we call RWR, rich uh, media of fame, RMS, rich media, fame, you know, of fame. But, fame. <clears throat> but they could not understand the value. It just so happened that in 2012 and 13, Google, by that time, they understood and they came up with that thing. But that was all marketing at that point. And when Google came out with, um, uh, you know, the semantic search with knowledge graph. Uh, I use the word ontology and world model and they use the word knowledge graph. So that was the one difference. And the second is they never revealed that those knowledge graph was developed manually. When I gave myself a keynote in 2007 in China at the knowledge graph conference with 600 people in the audience, the person who introduced me was uh, a member of uh, in, in Bay Area, uh, Google Knowledge Graph development team. He said we have 10,000 people contributing to this program, maintaining. They are not, you know, they, they, they're not doing magic, right? But they never revealed to the world that there are all these human, you know, sent processes and editors there in Knowledge Graph. I was far better, uh, you know, in Tali, he had two and a half people working on our tools to develop our Knowledge Graph. Not the same sale as Google, but certainly more, you know a lot more automated. So anyway, it's not these are not guys are not doing it for free. There is no magic there. They set all these you know people. Uh, uh, what is called? Uh, it's all business guided. What, See what is the uh, we're talking about? It uh, the um, these people who are doing instant GPT, uh, 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 reinforcement, testing based. RHL. RHL. They they're doing that. And then do, do you remember the uh, story about and then Gary Marcus publicized about uh, lots of people being paid, uh, uh, you know, in in Africa, Kenya or somewhere, mm -hmm. doing the interview. 
So they are doing all their stuff there. Then this thing happens. No, they're, they're not doing any magic here, okay? Okay. 